Columbus Metropolitan Club. This is our second forum this week. It is great to see all of you here. I'm Carol Newcomb Aludo, the chair of CMC's Board of Trustees. CMC, of course, welcomes everyone. Today's CMC Forum, Conversation 2019, it's our annual event, is sponsored by the Jefferies Company, AT&T, and Planned Parenthood Advocates of Central Ohio. Each are presented are represented by many friends and associates in the audience today. Won't you please help me thank them? <laughs> Shared values and aspirations passed from generation to generation provide the foundation of the ideal family business. There are many examples, families of teachers, firefighters, doctors, lawyers, and politicians. Today, we are honored to hear from one of Ohio's families who invest their time, intellect, passion, and resources in the pursuit of a better life for all of us. Please help me welcome a man who has served at the state and federal level since 1974, U.S. Senator Sherrod Brown. And serving our community from City Hall since 2015, Columbus City Councilwoman Elizabeth Brown. <laughs> and of course, our forum host and host, host of WBNS TV 10's Face the State, and Emmy Award winning journalist, Scott Light. Scott, thank you. Hi, you two. Hi. Let's talk. <laughs> I want to start uh, chronologically here because uh, I had a terrific coffee with um, Liz the other day, and she was giving me a lot of um, family anecdotes about where public service and this commitment to building up your neighborhoods and making them better. She was telling me that, um, uh, I don't know if it started, but certainly two integral parts uh, to this whole thing were both of your grandmothers. Um, Emily, of course, your mother, and your other grandmother, Carolyn. Let's start there, Senator. Tell us about your mom and where her passions were when it came to public service, improving life for the good of the whole, and how did she instill that in you? Thanks, I love talking about my mother. It's, I know Liz loves talking about her grandmother. Uh, my mom, Emily, um, our, our, our first daughter is named after my mother, Emily Brown, who is here. Emily, just if I can introduce you. So, uh, and, Emily, Emily has pursued public service, but we can talk about that at some point. My mother, uh, Emily Campbell, was born in Mansfield, Georgia, and my father was born in Mansfield, Ohio. And they met at the Mayflower Hotel in Washington when my mother had gone to serve the war effort in the 1940 and the 40s. And my dad was back from overseas service in the Army, and they met at a soldier's dance in their first, at the Mayflower, and their first, um, their first uh, uh, date was at the Willard Hotel in Washington and they fell in love they were my dad was was um, my dad was drafted in the army was on the older age of, of people that served and my mom was had been a teacher for a couple of years and they met in Washington came came to Mansfield and and my mom my mom was she comes from a sort of a typical white southern small town family. Mansfield, Georgia was 500 people, but my mom always cared about civil rights, and she she got she was president of the Ohio YWCA, which uh, next to Planned Parenthood is one of the best advocates for women's rights and for civil rights of any organization out there. Um, she. She got to um, she got to pick up Shirley Chisholm at the airport once and spend an hour with her and the first African American woman to ever run for president. Uh, and she would come back with these stories to us, but she always principally cared about civil rights and got my brothers. I'm the youngest of three boys. Got us engaged, and she um, her last her last um, good day on earth was the swearing in the inauguration of Barack Obama. She had supported Obama before anybody else in the family in the primaries, and 
she was um, in hospice for the last five, six weeks of her life, mm -hmm. and did had a had an okay death. And we got to be with her every single day, except she told Connie and me to go to the inauguration. My brothers were there um, at the house, and she, it was her last really alert day, January twentieth. 2009, and she did, was a celebration in so many ways of what her life was. What was her reaction on your first um, elective win? Um, first she played. Home? She played such a role. My dad. My dad really wondered why I was doing it. Um, <laughs> my dad. My dad was a family physician, and um, he really. I mean, he really emphasized. I, I give most of my social justice views, ascribe them to my mother, but my dad really did care about. I mean, he. He was, my dad actually was one of maybe 12 people in America that voted for Barry Goldwater in 1964 and George McGovern in 1972. <laughs> and the 72 vote had a whole lot to do with influence of his sons. Um, but my dad always took care of people regardless of ability to pay. He found ways to take care of low income patients. And um, so he, he, taught, he taught me that. Um, but um, both both of them, both of them were those kinds of grandparents. My dad didn't say much. My mom, obviously, said much more. <laughs> had that influence. Councilmember Brown, let's talk about Carolyn, yeah. uh, who, by the way, I, and you, you, the senator mentioned the family uh, connection with the names. Carolyn is also the name of your of your daughter. Of my daughter. Yeah. Yes. Tell us about your grandmother. Yeah. Um, so I think about both my grandmothers a lot in terms of why I wanted to run for office or why I had an interest in public policy. Uh, and I've always thought of them that way. I, I think about them uh, even more recently uh, because I, I think they would be deeply troubled by a lot of what's happening in our country. Carolyn in particular, um, she had a real love for her community. Um, my, she raised her four girls um, with my grandfather Clark outside Dayton and she cared deeply about Dayton and always found ways to be working and bolstering her own community. Um, and she also loved to, um, she had a lot of foreign born students that would come and stay in their house. She loved the world. Um, she was a Spanish teacher and she would, they would put all their girls into um, a station wagon and drive to Mexico for vacation from Dayton, Ohio. Um, <laughs> um, she, she really um, sort of believed in the idea of a global community and um, really believed in uh, progressive ideals too, but she taught my sister Emily and me, uh, along with our grandmother Emily, both of them, I think, taught us a lot about why we, my sister Emily is a um, public interest lawyer um, and represents immigrant families. And uh, I really think both of our grandmothers have a lot to do with that, in addition to our dad. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but in so many ways, it's, 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 their, it's their influence as women in our lives. By the way, Senator, Liz tells me the smartest person in the family is Emily. So no offense, but yeah. Emily, sorry, Dad. That's okay. Emily's got the, the biggest brain of everybody. She does. <laughs> Let's fast forward a little bit. I would say, what can I say? What? Sure. Em Emily is Emily. While in law school, gave birth to two children. Um, while in law school, and it just Emily is, and she wow. had one of the hardest law schools in the country, and she is really, she really is smart. But so she is, is Elizabeth. <laughs> <laughs> I have no yeah. problem with that. Let me, let, me, let, me, let me rescue you from that sure. comment. And, uh, <laughs> let's talk about when you and Emily were toddlers. You told me that this, this gentleman here to your right was omnipresent, that yeah. no matter what campaign he was running, mm -hmm. he was at school events, he was, he was everywhere. But you also said you kind of grew up on his speeches and, and pancake breakfast in the morning and spaghetti dinners at night. Mm -hmm. Talk about that life a little bit with your dad in public office. Yeah, um, well, one thing I liked, I don't know if you remember this, Dad, but in, I think it was my fourth grade teacher, it might have been my third grade teacher. So our, Emily's and my parents divorced when uh, I was three. Um, and then my dad lived um, in Lorain County and my mom lived in Licking County and we went to school in Licking County and went back and forth between households. And I forget if it was my third grade or fourth grade teacher, but she was shocked about halfway through the year when she realized that my dad didn't live in Granville with us because he was 
at everything. Um, every school play, every activity, Emily's basketball games. Everyone's very fortunate. I did not play basketball, but uh, Emily was pretty good. <laughs> and um, so it, it was, I mean, it was pretty remarkable to be representing a Northeastern Ohio district and having to work in DC and also being that present. And we feel really lucky for that. But we also, when we were in Lorraine with, with, with dad, we went to lots of events. And fortunately, I had my sister to um, help occupy my time. And we would tug at dad's tail coats and say, or coattails, excuse me, and say, let's go, let's go. We're done with this one. And then we'd move on to the next one. Well, Liz, Liz one time, we were in Springfield doing a parade. and. Liz was carrying candy and handing it out, and she kind of got mugged. I mean, some guy like candy Fred, mugged. Can, what's that? Candy mugged. Like I, I didn't have yeah, money. Yeah, they didn't. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. I mean, they, they yeah. kind of like pushed her to steal the candy. So we decided to scale back the parades a little bit. But one, one, one story. Liz, when I mean, I've you know run for office for a lot of years, and um, the, the the only election I lost in 1990, Liz was. They could see this was a tough race. I mean, they could see it was busy. I don't know what they could exactly see. And Liz would have been six, not to say I'm almost seven. And we were getting out of the car one day in Columbus, and she said, Dad, now, you're Secretary of State, right? And I said, yeah. She said, now, your job is to count the votes, right? And I said, yeah. She said, so, so, so what's the problem? <laughs> 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 and she figured out that... But then on, on election night, <laughs> election night when I lost, I remember putting them to bed. We were staying at, a, at probably a Sheraton downtown. And um, I, I, you know, you, if you do this enough, you know, you got to do, Daryl knows this, you got to do well enough. And I mean, I look at, I was not doing well enough in Portage County or something. I could just get a feel, Herb Asher knows this, early in the night that it wasn't going well. And so I put them to bed at maybe 10 or 11 o'clock, and there were still 35% of the votes out. And I told the girl, the girls heard that, and the next morning when Emily woke up, the first thing she said is, Dad, did they count the other 35% yet? Because oh, wow. she was so, anyway, wow. but things like that, so. Yeah. What was it like, speaking of campaigns, let's just pick up there. Um, when you saw the first negative ad about your dad, Yeah. what in the, it, it, you, you mentioned one to me that had a um, signature sign off. Oh, so yeah. Sayonara, Sherrod. When was that? I would have been six. It was the 1990 race. And I remember just, it was kind of a cartoony ad. So I thought it was just weird and silly. Um, and I didn't know what Sayonara, Sherrod meant, but they were saying, like, goodbye to your job or whatever. I mean, you could explain the politics of it. But no, the one that was, um, I actually really remember more. I was at my friend Mallory Donaldson's house. I don't I know, people here know Mallory, but I don't know if she's here. Um, uh, she was lived in Elyria then, but she um, works at the uh, at Columbus 2020 now. Um, anyway, I was at Mallory's house, and um, I saw the commercial that, uh, was it 92 or 94? They had that girl of about 10 years old oh, yeah. talking about how you took her parents' social security or something like that. <laughs> um, and <laughs> But it was a girl about my age talking straight to camera about how my dad had ruined her family's life. And it, I, I felt like, you have no idea what you're talking about, lady. You know, I mean, it, it didn't phase me in the right. sense that they, I thought she was speaking any truth. And it turns out there was an interesting backstory to that commercial. But that one was a little bit harder, yeah, I think. Sure. Emily and I both had to develop some thick skin um, because every two years somebody was trying to take his job, right? I mean, that, we knew that's what campaigns were. Uh, but that one was kind of disturbing to see. It was since it was almost a peer of mine, I guess. After the after the Sayonara Sharon series of ads, um, saying I it doesn't matter the background. I'd taken a trip to Japan, which I hadn't, but it was sort of the, it was the tagline of my opponent's ads. And um, the three days after the election, I'd t I was taking Emily and Liz to go to go roller skating. And Emily had her best friend with her, and, um, and Elizabeth, was that Elizabeth? I think it was her name was Elizabeth. And we're going out to the car, and Emily, and I think you were alone, I'm not sure. Emily and Liz and I went one way, and Elizabeth and her mom went the other way, and Elizabeth turns around, and this is three days after the election, and said, sayonara, Sherrod. <laughs> <laughs> Do something with that kid. <laughs> Anyway, she is never permitted to come to the house, yeah, she is, yeah. ever, <laughs> ever, yeah. ever again. Were there times, though, where you had to sit with both girls and it kind of explain, you know, yeah. this is kind of what dad does and these people say some nutty things about me and this is the way yeah, it is. I don't remember those conversations, but there are, yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, I think we we picked it up. I mean, I the the time that you really explained your job to me that has stuck with me, which some people in this room may have heard me tell this story because I, I do kind of tell it a lot, um, was in 1990-something um, when we were leaving church and a man flagged us, the three of us were leaving church and a man flagged us down um, to say thank you. He's a congressman, congressman, we all stopped and, and you turned around and he said thank you with this really earnest expression that at nine or 10 years old, however old I was, I could tell there was something very real behind his gratitude. So when we got into the car, I asked you what it was and you told me that you took a vote that not many people took and it meant a great deal to this person. And then you tried to explain to us what the Defense of Marriage Act was, because it was DOMA. My dad voted against DOMA when only a few dozen people in the House had the courage to do that um, in the mid-90s. <laughs> And that was the, f the first time that I really understood kind of what your job was besides meeting people, helping them solve a problem, X, Y, Z, but you really talking about how you can, you can stand on the side of principles and people or you can do something else. Well, the one of you, and I, I don't know if it was you or Emily said this after a conversation like that, um, been said, you know, I, I'm gonna vote this way and I know it's, going to make the election next year harder, and one of you said, well, why don't you just vote that way and not tell anybody? <laughs> and so, you know, I thought, I tried that, but that just, because of, because of people like Roland and you, I couldn't get away with it. Yeah. Democracy, you know? Right. So, even in Trump's America. <laughs> we'll get to that in just a little bit. Um, so, when you're traveling around, running for various offices, You've got your, your, your girls in tow, so to speak. Afterwards, was um, this commitment to public service, was it, was it an, an implicit or explicit, explicit part of your parenting? How did you talk about it and, and relay it to your daughters? Um, well, I, I talked about public service. I talked about, um, I, don't, I don't know exactly how to answer that. I, I mean, I, I, I tried, I, I didn't, I was very conscious about not making it their whole lives. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was what I did for a living. It meant sometimes when they were in spring break, um, I used to come, come back to Ohio every week, but um, when they were in spring break, they'd come to Washington for a week. Uh, we did, um, and, but when, you know, and I mean, I, I did, it wasn't like every time we were together we went to a parade. Sure. It wasn't anything like that. So we all, I mean, I always was conscious of this is my, this is my job, but this is not my entire life. And that's, that's sometimes hard to do in part because as Liz has found out quickly, because she's so good at doing what Abraham Lincoln used to say, I got to go out and get my public opinion bath. And Liz is really good at that. And Liz came to the conclusion, I remember when Connie and I first started dating, she realized this quickly, that when you're in church or at the grocery store or walking down the street, you're, you're public property. If you decide to do this for a living, mm -hmm. um, then that's what Emmanuel's learning. As you, I just saw a minute ago, it means you, it's what you do. And it's, you, you expect to be public that way. And um, that's an important component of that. But you also have to carve time when nobody's around in your home working the garden, or do we do every year with the, the, the highlight of the year for me, and maybe for them, I'm never quite sure, was we used to take a train trip every year. We'd go on Amtrak and go out west, and we'd go to a national park and a baseball stadium every year, and go to, we went right. to Montana once and stopped in Minneapolis, went to Denver, went to the Grand Canyon, went to the West Coast, whatever, and um, those, were, those were the best, those 10 days were the partly just riding on the train, and getting a sleeper car in our were the were the best days of my life in many ways. Um, they were they were young teen, well from small children into the young teens, and then they quit wanting to go with me on train trips. <laughs> but now they've talked about grandkids, train trips, Patrick, right? So. <laughs> but I mean, you, you talked about issues. I think yeah. really. Of course, we saw what he did for a living, but I mean, as I'm, I have a three-year-old and a one-year-old, my husband Patrick's here, our, our kids, Carolyn and Russell, I mean, I'm learning as a parent that so much of what you did, I think, is what most parents in this room do, which is you teach your kid through talking about values and principles and ideals, and we saw you act on those in your public life, but there was, I think, nothing 
remarkably different from what parents all over the country do every day to try to raise good people who give, give back to their communities. And you, you, you teach them your, about your faith. I, I um, wanted to, I brought this book along. This is, um, um, this, I was on an airplane soon after my divorce and some, a woman said to me, um, you, should, you should record things, just write about things your children and you do. So I went out and bought this um, nicely bound book and I started writing in it um, in April of 1987. So Elizabeth was three and Emily was six. And I wrote, they, they were, I wrote about things they did and they were really, really cute, but as they got older, they were really, really less cute, so I quit <laughs> writing as much. But for instance, um, one, one story in here, I was um, reading a Bible story to, to Liz and she was, couldn't have been more than three then, I was sitting on the bed and she says, Dad, Dad, stop for a second, what, what's the name of that guy, you know, Mary's guy that was born in the nest? <laughs> and Emily said, that was Jesus, Elizabeth, <laughs> like that. So stories like that. Some are only, I mean, I know we all think, as, we all, as Ann said, we all think our own kids are funnier than other people's kids. <laughs> Sometimes they are, you know. I'm checking the clock here because I just want to make sure that we get in everything before we toss it to some uh, audience questions. Can I ask you a question about um, kind of what put you on your path to public service? We were talking, you were working in New York after you graduated near the top of your class at Columbia, uh, New York Magazine, were right? you near the top of your class? I mean, that's probably No, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> but you, you at, at that point, you're working in New York and you feel, I don't know, a, 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 you tell me, was it a, a sense of obligation or just feeling like, I need to get back to Ohio, I need to pursue some other things? What was it? Well, I think I took a year between high school and college to do an AmeriCorps program called City Year. Is anyone familiar with City Year? I know AT&T is familiar with City Year. I see, I'm looking at Chris. Um, and City Year, for those of you who don't know, is an AmeriCorps program. You um, work in schools. Um, and at the time that I was an AmeriCorps member, I was in a school um, outside, in Philly because my sister was going to college outside Philly and I wanted to, if I was going to take a gap year, I wanted to do it near Emily. Um, and uh, it was a, basically an assistant teacher role doing um, uh, public service projects sort of infused in there was my charge. And I just learned so much in that year. It was formative for me. I learned so much about the manifestation of public policies and really how they intersect with people's lives. That stuck with me. You know, it's not just about textbooks and um, teacher ratios, which are very important, but it's also housing policy because I was the one who took kids out of the class to walk them around if they were having a behavior issue um, and hearing about what went on the night before that was contributing to that, right? And um, at 18, I just was able to see it in a new way that um, when I was a kid behind the desk just the year earlier, you don't see. You know, when you step outside the desk and are on the teacher's side, you see things differently. So that instilled in me this idea that I, 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 I wanted, I was interested in public policy, and I think it took a while of working in New York to realize if I was going to work in politics and government to try to impact public policy, I wanted to do it in my home state. Um, you know, I care deeply about Ohio and um, the opportunity that we provide city by city, neighborhood by neighborhood to people. So that's why I moved back here. Um, and I, I ran for office. You know, it's one thing to decide I wanted to try to impact public policy, but I really ran for office because of my dad, because I don't know that I otherwise would have had the faith, maybe I would have, but I don't know for sure that I would have had the faith that I can do this work and I can make an impact without having to compromise principle. You know, I mean, there's, there's almost a myth out there that um, politicians don't have people's backs, and I lived with um, proof that they can. You know, I, I grew up seeing that. You don't have to move to the squishy middle, if you will, in order to get things done. Um, you can accomplish things and also um, stick to your principles. And that was really important for me to know was possible if I was going to do this. So it, it really is because of, of my dad that I had the confidence. And without um, making an endorsement of somebody running for re-election, she has done that. <laughs> thank you. Do you ever? But thank you. But when 
when I ran for office for the first time in 2015, a lot of people asked me, you're, I'm sure you're talking to your dad every day, getting all sorts of advice, what's his advice? And um, I was seven months pregnant at the time, so I was. I said, my dad's advice only goes so far, because he never had to do this seven. He never had to campaign seven months pregnant. Um, it's a whole other ball game. <laughs> well, she she really didn't, and we, we didn't really have an arrangement exactly. But um, you know, she she didn't ask for a lot of advice, and I didn't push myself in any way on her. I helped her a little, but I didn't help her that much. I mean, she knew so much because she had been part of this, but she really, she really did this race on her own, which made me a lot prou even prouder of her and showed the voters that she stands by herself and stands with, I mean, we, none of us stand by ourselves, stands by herself, but she really did it. We'll talk about that a little bit more in terms of the, the, the fullness in your heart when you hear from your daughter, I'm running for city council. Yeah. What was that like? That was pretty cool. I mean, first, it was even, I mean, I could sort of see that moving in that direction. But the, the, the best part was when she moved back to Columbus and I saw then that she wanted to do public service here and get involved in, in, uh, in those kinds of activities here. That was, that was the one that hit me, the hit was I was most excited about because she was coming back to the state. Mm -hmm. But it, it was not, it was a, I didn't know she was gonna run for consul, that that, but I figured she was moving to, in the direction of running for office. Let so. me ask about that uh, in this way. Um, because we have a couple of different generations represented here. So, Senator, when you look at the toxicity of politics right now, do you worry that there will be fewer people who are going to, fewer good people on all sides who are going to run for office? Sure, I worry about that. I think everybody in this room does. Um, it's, it's, I, and I, I think what I've also thought about is, I mean, I, this, is, this is not empty flattery. Elizabeth is a whole lot better public speaker and a whole lot better at this job when I was, than I was when I was her age. I mean, I, I don't say that as empty flattery, it really is true. I, I watch how talented she is and how committed she is. I also, though, recognize that when I first ran for office, um, uh, Democrats did better in this state than they do now. And this is a, this state is equally, is, is more challenging for somebody with her in my views today, probably challenging to be successful, more of a challenge to be successful than it was 20 or 30 years ago. So she's, she's, as I said, I think she's better than I am at it, um, but I also think that she's got to be to win in an uh, environment where Republicans win time after time after time after time in this state. Do you worry about your peers? when you talk to people and say, you know what, you ought to, you know, bring that idea to a city council meeting or, you know, jump in this race. Do you worry about this younger generation being turned off by politics? I actually don't worry about people being turned off by politics. I, I, I mean, it is hard to see what's going on. And, um, I mean, I really ha felt more nervous and more scared after the send her back chance at the Trump rally two nights ago. I mean, I don't care what your political opinions are. That was shocking. So I don't mean to diminish how appalling some of um, the news cycle can be on a daily basis, but I see regular people, everyday people, really engaged in the process. And I'll give you one example, but true, I mean, truly, I, I see it all the time. And I don't just mean the Parkland students who were very inspiring, but, but still far away, right there in Florida. Um, I mean right here. Right after um, the 2016 elections, there was an excitement of, of kind of women running for office. Um, and I happened, my um, stepsister Laura tagged me in a chain of a couple women I didn't know asking each other, I don't even know where to start. You know, do I want to run for office? I don't know. What do you do in office? What are the offices that exist that one can run for? I mean, really baseline mm -hmm. questions. And they were kind of on fire but didn't know where to put it. So she tagged me on Facebook. And what it turned into was a conversation with these two women. Again, I've never met them. We created an Eventbrite for a meeting at the public library where people could come and just learn like Government 101 and figure out if they were interested in this. And then the plan was, if people were, we'd plug them into a candidate training. So we, we had this idea to do this. Um, the event sold out and we held uh, over the course of four months, three of these events at the public library because they'd sold out and we wanted to get to every single person um, who, who was interested. 
And I did this with two women I did not meet until the day we all showed up at the library. Um, and I had my little like nerdy government PowerPoint that I'd done on my computer. Um, and that's just one story that not, and not nearly everyone in that um, room then turned around and ran for office, but they were really excited to learn about ways to engage. Um, and it, I, I do think it helped people. And I think there are things like that happening all over the community. Speaking of engaging, we're going to ask folks, we've got about five minutes, and then we're going to throw it over to that kind of that corner there by the uh, camera and where Andy's holding up his hands. So if you have some questions uh, for the senator or for Council Member Brown, please make your way over there, and we'll get to that in just a little bit. Speaking of which, we've had a few days to kind of, well, digest those chants that you were talking about. Um, the tweets that came from this president that, that kind of started this this whole thing. Um, how do you view it, Senator? Where are we in this whole debate over race, racism, and presidential behavior? Well, I, would, I, I, I was not a, not surprising to many of you, I was not a big fan of, of George W. Bush, but he, um, I didn't think he told the truth about the Iraq, the Iraq War, and I didn't like what he wanted to do with Medicare and Social Security, a number of other things. But you all can remember back in 2011, within a few days, maybe a week, of the, the terrorist attacks, George Bush went to a mosque. And he said, it wasn't Muslims who attacked our country, it was terrorists who attacked our country. And I uh, imagine President Trump would do anything like that. He, of course, wouldn't, and, it, and it's troubling. And I, I talk to my colleagues. Um, I can't say too much about what I'm going to say. Uh, I had a conversation. Uh, Mitt Romney came into my office the other day, and, and just to talk to him and to those Republicans that really do think about this. And again, I can't describe what he said because it was a private meeting. But there is a, there is a whole lot of anguish among a lot of Republican members of Congress, and um, some, like Romney, have spoken out more than others, but it's troubling. I, I, I think this presidential election is going to be uh, Donald Trump playing to race and immigration and fear. Uh, this whole election will be about that. That was just sort of the beginning last night, or the other night, um, and it's troubling. I think that this country is better than that, and I am way more optimistic for this country and for this state than to believe that, that that will work, but I think that's what he sees as his path to re-election. Were, were the tweets racist? Oh, yeah. He's a racist. I mean, he, he um, starting, I mean, to cite his, I don't, I don't, I don't want to applause for that. I just, I mean, start, start with the Nixon, the conservative Nixon Justice Department finding his family, he and his dad discriminated on housing, to the Central Park Five, he still, he digs in on. Um, said, well, they confessed. Yeah, they confessed because of what happened with the police and all. Then the Obama campaign, then Charlottesville. Then people that have worked with him have said he, he engages in racist talk a lot of the time. I, I, I can't prove that. The other I see with, with eyes wide open. And um, that a president would, you know, that a president would, would try to build his name and image and future around dividing people. That's, that's bad enough. I mean, because so much of his presidency has been divisions. He mocks his opponents. He criticizes the people he hired. Jay Powell, the chair of the Federal Reserve, is a guy I know pretty well from a banking committee. And he's, he, Trump appointed him, and he's always attacking Jay Powell. I mean, it's just, I mean, that's not the most important, most significant thing, but, but just this all upheaval, chaos, injecting this anger and division and race and religion into our public discourse um, is just really troubling. Let's continue the discourse in another way. As promised, this is tradition here with the CMC, and that is to open it up to questions from you in the audience. So we have a line over there. If you would, state your name. We do ask you not to editorialize. If you can get to the question pretty quickly, state your name and what you'd like to ask, please. Thank you. My name is Renee Delane uh, of Women Who Dare, and I would ask each of you to answer this question. What person of color living or not, of either gender or any orientation, would you say is the person you have you feel most proud to support or to have supported their views? In politics? 
No, it doesn't have to be politics, anything, any, okay. any experience at all in life. Well, I mean, the, the person of color who has made the most impact on my life is Toni Morrison, um, who is a um, Lorraine native. Um, I've had the honor of seeing her speak twice, and, um, but beyond that, I've been reading her since I was a little girl. And um, Beloved, Song of Solomon um, were the two that, that made the biggest impression on me. I wrote my, my senior thesis on Song of Solomon, and so there is a kinship you feel with a writer who wouldn't know who you are when you enter a room. <laughs> um, and, and I do feel that um, with Toni Morrison. Uh, I, I feel that I know her, um, and I feel that she has blessed me with her wisdom and her beauty. And I, I bought the whole Toni Morrison set of books. Um, and then Emily took them all, so I'm glad you brought that up, so maybe I will eventually get some of them back. Um, I, I, would, I would say John Lewis. i not surprising maybe that I would give an answer of, a, of an elected official. And John, um, Emily Elizabeth got to go to Selma with John. Uh, we've led, I've gone four times, I think they've gone once with me. I, I led, a, led pilgrimages there with other members of Congress. And um, no, nobody was as courageous as John, nobody's as kind as John. Uh, nobody had, a uh, few people had the impact. Uh, he wasn't well known at the time. He was the youngest person to speak at the Dr. King speech at the Lincoln Memorial, the I Have a Dream speech. John was the youngest one, and they had to pull him back to keep his rhetoric from being too hot. And he just never, never, ever forgets. Um, and he once, I won't tell the whole story for, for time reasons, but he um, used to say, make trouble, make good, necessary trouble. And that's how, he, that's how he's lived his incredible life. Hi, I'm Bill Lafayette, I own Regionomics, and even though I'm an economist, I'm very fundamentally optimistic about uh, the country and our city and our state, and I see the conversation changing from that for the first time in my life. And I'm just wondering how folks like me, just common ordinary people, can kind of change the conversation back to a place of optimism and that we can do better and we can grow. You want to go first? Uh, no. <laughs> I will if you want. Okay. Um, sort of one at a time. I, 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 that's a pretty cliche-ish answer, but and not in a fairly shallow one. But um, I. I you know, this, this, is a, this has become, people like to say it's become a tribal society that, that you're, you know, and, and I mean, one, of the, one of the questions I, uh, this will directly answer, but when I was, this is something I can say, when I was talking to uh, Senator Romney yesterday, he came over to my office and we spent about probably 30 minutes and I asked him, I said, what's, what's the difference? You may know that the evangelical community is overwhelmingly very supportive of the president, according to polls. The Mormon community, not nearly as much. I mean, the Mormons are more likely Republicans, but they, they have problems with Trump because of character, and is the way Romney would say it. But he said the difference is the, the Mormon church has more, they have one leader, the president elect, I believe elected by the, by the elders, I'm not sure how the structure of the church works. And they, they have a respect for authority. The evangelicals are a little more atomized and less like that. And he, he thinks it's, it's a lot of it is about that. Um, and I think it's also because people like Romney have spoken out about, about the president's character. But, it, but just talking to him and talking to others, I really think it's sort of changing people's minds one at a time, not get caught up in all the, all the cacophony of, of politics these days. And, in the divisions, and this is, and I, I would just, I would just say this: I, this is not the worst time in our nation's history. I, I, I would say, and I don't want you to applaud this. Probably most of you agree with it, but I, I think this is the worst president in my lifetime. But I don't think this is the worst American time for our country, and maybe American history. I don't know a lot about James Buchanan, but, um, <laughs> the, but this is the worst. This is not the worst time in our history. The McCarthy era was worse. Um, the Depression was worse. The Civil War, to be sure, was worse. So this, we, we will get through this. Um, the question is how and how do, we, how, do we, how do we heal as a nation and as a society after this, this, um, this divisiveness? 
The only thing I would add is um, if you have children in your life, teach them to be kind and teach them the difference. <laughs> teach them that difference is a beautiful thing and a um, wonderful part of our country. Uh, actually, uh, Shannon Ginther um, read, I was at a meeting with her last week and her, uh, the mayor's mother recently passed and she read us a, um, a it was a, some re a reading and I'm not doing a good job of uh, regurgitating it because I don't remember who wrote it, um, but it was a reading that they were going to read at the um, Andy's mother's funeral all about teaching that difference is to be celebrated. And I, so if you have children in your life, teach them those things and teach them to be kind. And I, I'm just so much more optimistic about this. I mean, I mentioned the, the, you know, the direction politically of the state and the, the, the toxicity of politics, but I'm so optimistic of, of young people because of young, just, just the different, the way young people look at diversity is so much different from my generation. And that, that's so inspiring, that just in, a, in and of itself, Trip, as you know. Next question. Good afternoon, I'm Kathy Fox. I wanted to follow up on um, what Liz was talking about, about women um, deciding to start running after 2016. In my lifetime, I've seen women make a couple steps forward and then at least one step back in terms of um, the numbers of women in political office. Do you think it will make a difference if we get to the point where women are 50% of the office holders? I do. I think it will make a difference. Um, but we also have to think about representative democracy in the sense of people of color. Um, how many African Americans, um, how many uh, uh, Latinos, how many uh, immigrants. I mean, when I look at um, Ilhan Omar and the fact that she is a naturalized citizen and believes so much in America and what we stand for that she decided to run for office, there's nothing more American than that. I mean, that's one reason I'm so appalled um, by the, the center back chance is she, she immigrated here, she naturalized and she ran for office. That's incredible. I, I was at a, I had the cleansing experience this week of giving remarks at a naturalization ceremony yesterday uh, morning in um, Judge Marbley's courtroom. And I looked out over 52 petitioners, brand new U.S. citizens from 30 countries. And I was so grateful that they're here in our city because they are really making the Columbus of the future alongside all of us here. And so when we think about representative democracy, part of it is, yes, women should be 50% eh, more. Um, but <laughs> um, but it's, it, it, it isn't you know, that simple. We really need to think about representation um, really broadly and um, and I think that if we have we were promised a representative democracy by our framers and, and founders uh, we have yet to actualize that um, when we do we will all do better Nevada's the first state <laughs> Nevada Nevada has 50% has a majority of women in their legislature, and they have two female U.S. senators. One of them I, I just love, Catherine Cortez Masto. The other, uh, Senator Rosen, I don't know as well yet. She's new. But I just had a conversation with Catherine about what a majority, because I said to her, I said, you have majority women now, because I think they had a special election and pushed it to over 50 percent. And she just started talking about how, how, they, how this state is getting better, her state, because she can see things already out of that legislature. So it's... And about naturalization ceremonies, how, how many of you have ever been to a naturalization ceremony? Third half, yeah. I, go, go to one. They are, they are the most inspiring, uplifting. It's an hour. It's free. It's at the federal courthouse um, at least every couple of weeks, if not more, right? Yeah, something like that. And they, they are just wonderful because you see people often in their native dress. They want to come to this. They want to be citizens. They are more informed, frankly, than many of us in this country who are citizens. And it's just the great, just if you're, when you're, depressed or down about our society, our country, our future, go to that and it will change you. Next question. <clears throat> My name is Tom Tucker, originally from Mansfield, Mansfield Ohio. Ohio. I was his paper boy. When uh, <laughs> I was. I was his paper boy, Coleman Road. <laughs> I 
I'm here with three of my four children. We recognized Sherrod had a lot of possibilities when he was living <laughs> our paper. And in fact, my wife, Kate, gave the first coffee for him on his way up the ladder. Wow, that's true. Wow. Yeah. You've encouraged our family to be active uh, in politics, and follow, we followed you all your career, and we're sure Elizabeth will be just as well, and perhaps go further than you do. <laughs> Thank you. Think how, think how nice it would have been if I got the paper there earlier in the morning and <laughs> delivered the plane dealer, because I wasn't the greatest paper boy ever. I, 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 don't anyway. know, I don't know if the crowd heard during the applause, too. You said the name of the street. Coleman Road. It was right, right down. I know 679. Was that the number? Something like What was the number? No, 679 was further down. Never mind. Five, so that doesn't matter. Anyway, <laughs> Coleman yeah. Road, Mansfield. Yeah, I can't remember what I had for breakfast this morning, but okay. <laughs> uh, next question. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Hua Wang, and I'm a professor at The Ohio State University in food science, microbiology, and uh, interdisciplinary nutrition. And uh, I want to take this opportunity to share a story uh, about uh, Senator uh, Brown. Probably Elizabeth or Emily probably don't even know. Uh, only a few of us from the Ohio State probably have heard about that. Uh, I study antibiotic resistance, which is a, a hot topic everybody knows about. And uh, many years ago, about a dec more than a decade ago, we've discovered that actually it, the problem is not necessarily uh, deal with raw meat and chicken that everybody heard about, but it's actually due to uh, cheese and yogurt. Everybody eat it, you know, we all enjoy it, and including fresh produce. So when I had this discovery, it was a shocking news. I was so worried because my colleagues said, you're going to wipe out the whole industry, right? <laughs> I, I was worried about losing my job. Uh, at that point, uh, you know, think about what uh, uh, Senator Brown just said, public service and principle, right, and doing things effectively. So what we have done is, in fact, we have uh, uh, published the data, and I uh, work with my colleague and through our Ohio State University co uh, office in uh, Washington, D.C., contacted uh, Cheryl, uh, Cheryl's office. And shortly, I got a message from him asking me to help him work on his draft bill on the topic, sending to uh, 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 working with the senators. So I was so shocked I provided my uh, input. Shortly, I noticed it turned into reality. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, uh, and I can tell you very uh, uh, another side of the story. Uh, you don't see cheese and yogurt on the table or vegetables as salad today, right? I work with the program office, uh, office until I <laughs> explain that, but no, I'm just kidding. I just become a member <laughs> this week, but I really enjoy it. Anyway, the good news is we worked with our industry from Ohio, which is the Swiss Cheese Consortium, that allow us to uh, go to their company and a manufacturing plan and figure out step by step where the problem came from. In fact, we, it only took us four years to solve this major problem impacting everybody's dinner table, our dinner plate, yogurt and cheese, that now you can eat these food uh, without any problems. So I wanted to say that uh, my colleagues nationwide, whether it's uh, from uh, Dallas or from, uh, uh, from Iowa, when I share the story about my interaction with uh, Senator Brown, they said, you are so lucky you have a great senator who are re so receptive to science and really help solve the biggest problem impacting the world. So I wanted to share that story. <laughs> I want to add a little bit more. There's another half of the story. You know and, uh, <laughs> okay. Yeah, let's get to one more thanks, question. Thanks. Okay. Sorry. Later Thank on. You. Thanks. Hello, my name's Bill Murawski. I have a question on health care. What are your opinions on the current uh, lower uh, court case? where they're going to be ruling on the constitutionality of the ACA. And should they be successful, what do you believe would be the contingencies in a situation like that? 
again, this is the case that's based uh, Texas, on. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I, the, the president couldn't repeal the Affordable Care Act through the legislative process, through the Democratic small D process, um, because of Susan Collins and, um, and John McCain and Lisa Murkowski voting no. Uh, the, there was no plan, they said replace and repeal and replace, there was no plan to re anything to replace it with, so that didn't work, so the president, it's so important to him in part because it's called Obamacare by some, my view, um, that he went through the courts to do it, and I'm concerned because if the courts strike it down, uh, we lose the expansion in this state that, that John Kasich did. Uh, 25-year-olds aren't in their parents' plans any longer. The prescription drug benefit's gone for seniors. A uh, big part of it, uh, the, the, the preventive care for seniors is, is wiped away. I don't see any, I don't know how Congress would fix it with the divisions, how, how we would put any of the toothpaste back in the tube. I don't think that McConnell would, I think it'll be chaotic and I think that's probably what the president wants there. And, um, a lot, a lot, a lot of people will be hurt. Yeah, I, I think the court will not decide that in the end. The district court where suits like that are often filed in the Eastern District of Texas, he, that's not a surprise he did it, but I think as it works its way up, I can't imagine they would wanna, they would wanna create that much chaos in the healthcare system. It will hurt the hospitals in this city for sure. It will close hospitals in rural Ohio. Hmm. Thank you for all of your questions. Are, are you sure you don't want to run for president? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No. No offense, but I, I meant that question for Liz. <laughs> She's 35. <laughs> Carol, back to you. Thank you. I hope you all found this today's forum a reason for optimism in the future. We let's thank our sponsors, the Jeffrey Company and AT&T and Planned Parenthood of Central Ohio. <laughs> and of course, our speakers, Sherrod Brown, Elizabeth Brown, and Scott Light. Thank you. <laughs> we look forward to seeing you next week.